Good morning, friends, and welcome. So good to see all of you. I know you've come from so many different directions today, some across more snowy paths than others. Glad to have you here. Uh, Schooler is such a wonderful event for us. As always, we're grateful to the Schooler family who got this started and uh, who continue to support the school in wonderful ways. My privilege this morning to uh, not only welcome all of you, many of you preachers, many of you pastors, but to welcome a preacher and pastor who will be in our midst uh, for the next two days, uh, Dr. Anna Carter Florence. Um, Peter Marshall Professor of Preaching at Columbia Theological Seminary. Lectures and conversations, she will invite us to participate and consider the world of theater as a model for how we read scripture together. Dr. Carter Florence uh, preaches in events like this and in churches across the country. Have some sense of her work, have watched her uh, at the Canopy of Homiletics and other settings. We are in for a treat. One of the things that uh, we didn't include in the bio that we shared with all of you is her interest in the intersections of preaching and other fields and disciplines. That's something all of us can be aware of. Uh, we think about how we need to preach and, and, and what we need to do to communicate, uh, to, to know that there are important things around us that we can draw on to preach. This, uh, this is an important thing to remember. She, she takes text seriously. Uh, I think I read that you, uh, you find authority in preaching uh, to the extent uh, you understand the text. And that, that's important for us to, uh, to remember. The other thing that, that I found interesting in the, in the short time we've been together this morning, Dr. Carter Florence has asked a number of questions. Well, when, when, did, uh, when did this Schooler Lecture Series get started? What, what's going on at the school? And, I've found that good preachers uh, exegete not only the text, but their, their context and, and where they are, and, and I'm appreciative of that. Uh, one of the other things I've heard about this preacher, this, this teacher, is her interest in uh, looking at scripture in terms of the verbs. Uh, not so much uh, the, the substance of things, but what's going on. What, what are people doing or not doing? So it's time for me to sit down and let you do. Welcome. Good morning. I'm so grateful to be here with all of you. I'm so grateful to the invitation. I'm grateful to the faculty here and the staff. And I'm even enjoying the snow. Um, I'm sorry about that. But you know, in Atlanta, it looks a little different right now. So um, for me, it's kind of a thrill. My sophomore year of college, I signed up for a course called Theater Studies. I thought it was going to be a break in my schedule. I was spending a lot of time in the library. I was a history major. I thought, what could be so bad? We're going to be reading Shakespeare's plays, watching you know, films with British actors from the BBC, doing all of this stuff. The first day of class, I almost dropped the course because the professor was using so many words that I had no idea what they meant. Um, semiotics, hermeneutics, performativity, and Elizabethan drama. I was seriously over my head. And I was not the only one. Everyone else in the room, I think, was too. That was the lecture component. The next day, the practice component was completely different. The professor got us out of this sleek lecture hall. We trooped down the street to this dusty old building, big empty building, drew our chairs into a circle. And at that point, our professor stopped talking about the plays that we were reading, and he set us loose with them. And what he said was, go and rehearse one, go and rehearse a scene, and come back when you found something true. And then we'll see. We'll talk about it, we'll rework it, and we will see. And together, we will find something that the text wants to say. And a whole new world opened up for me that year. I learned that some texts, all texts, can benefit from study and theory and 
reference tools, and those are really important, but some texts also need to be practiced, and we need to be set loose with them. We need to even, here's my metaphor I'm lifting up for today that we'll keep developing, we need to go rehearse them, and then we need to come back and see when we found something true. And as a community then, we'll rework it, we'll talk about it, we'll see what happens, and together through a power that is never our own, we will see something more truthful about God and who God is and who we are as God's people. So that's the, that's the preamble, and now I'm going to launch in. I told Jay this is a, a book that I've been working on for way too long. Um, if you know anything about writing, that's, some people are really fast, some people are very slow. I fall in the latter category. So this, this book is now on my editor's desk, and I'm like this. So, okay. I used to be a solitary reader. By that, I mean I read by myself on my own for school or work or pleasure. I would talk about what I'd read with others, whether in class or meetings or even the occasional book group, but those discussions were always after the fact. Reading came first, and when I read, I read alone. Now I am a teacher of a very odd practice, preaching. Right, Valerie? Very odd. Uh, you would think this would entail a lot of talking or teaching others how to talk. But in my experience, it is mainly about reading. And not solitary reading, reading together as a community. Reading scripture inside and out, upside and down, with a place at the table for everyone. Most days, that's what I'm trying to learn and trying to teach how to be a community that reads scripture together. How to read so we can say something true. And it wasn't seminary that taught me to be a community reader. Nor was it the church during my growing up years. It was my time, as I've just told you, in theater studies. At the precise moment when I was supposed to be honing and perfecting my solitary reading skills, I stumbled into a class that didn't require them. In fact, we were asked to check those skills at the door. Instead, our professor invited us to read in new ways. Not alone, together. Not once, again and again. Not to explain or portray the text in some definitive version, but to find something true alongside other true discoveries. It was reading as a community and it formed community. It made us hungry for the text and for the joy of showing one another all that the text could say. Years later, I stumbled into my first preaching class in seminary and did a double take. Wasn't this community reading too? We were given a biblical text. We were sent out to read it together again and again. We were asked to come back and show one another in workshop all that the text could say. The goal wasn't to preach the definitive sermon, it was to proclaim something true from a living word. We could trace it in our reading, but we could hardly speak it without stammering. So we tried in every class, and we got close, and we fell short, and it made us hungry for the text and the joy of showing one another all that the text could say, all that scripture could say. This is a joy, I think, that is too good to keep in a preacher's only classroom. It's a gift we are all meant to share, and so is proclamation, speaking something true. And I think new ways of reading can help us. So, if you are hungry to encounter scripture and meet the living word, you are in good company. Many of us, people of faith, people with doubts, dedicated churchgoers, those who are seeking, and yes, maybe even preachers, are hungry these days. We crave nourishment that will sustain us and wisdom that will guide us and community that will walk with us along the way. We yearn for justice for all God's people and a peace that passes all understanding. 
as the Greeks said to Philip, we want to see Jesus. And since scripture is a reliable place to search, in my tradition, sola scriptura declares that it's the first and the best place, we are eager to read it and to follow in the way of gospel. The problem is that many of us are reading on our own. And that can be slow going. Slow enough to make you think you aren't getting anywhere and it would be better to leave the reading to the professionals and the speaking to the preachers, which in a number of instances is exactly what has happened. It's not that we think preachers are the only ones qualified to read and speak about scripture. In fact, our theology tells us just the opposite. The priesthood of all believers opens the task of proclamation to everyone. But solitary readers are at a greater risk of dropping out of that priesthood. And a lot of us are in the solitary habit these days, preachers included, and maybe preachers especially. That habit can lead to some unhealthy patterns. We may have all the elements that make for excellent readers, great book, motivation to ta tackle it, theological, to mandate, theological mandate to do so, and for preachers, a Sunday deadline, or whenever it is. But, um, uh, yeah, but we need more, sorry, losing place, but we need more flexible reading strategies that will lower the dropout statistics, because at the moment, a lot of us are hungry and a little bored with our reading and not sure what to do next. We might as well be teenagers at lunchtime who open a well-stocked refrigerator, survey the contents, turn to you accusingly and announce there is nothing to eat. <laughs> of course there's plenty to eat. What the teenagers are telling you is, one, what's ever in the fridge is in a whole food state and has to be cooked before it can be eaten. <laughs> two, they don't really know what to cook or how to cook it. And three, rather than learn, they would really like you to do it for them. Some parents take on that role and never give it up. But if you want your teenagers to ever leave home and fend for themselves, Eventually, you have to show them that the pound of hamburger and the green pepper staring at them from the third shelf really can become a lovely spaghetti sauce if you saute them with some onion and garlic and herbs and olive oil and tomatoes. Otherwise, you end up with a house full of entitlement-driven young adults who believe that your primary purpose in life is to wait on them. comes from truth. A faith community that lets its people drop out of their calling to read and speak about scripture will soon be sitting on the best stocked refrigerator in the universe that no one but the preacher can use. And it won't be locked and hidden away this incredibly stocked larder that is our scripture, it'll be right there at the center of everything. In most churches, there's a refrigerator in every pew. So when the people walk in hungry, open the door, stare at the contents, surprise, it won't be clear to them how Leviticus could ever be nourishing, let alone appetizing, let alone dinner. They won't have any idea of where to start, except that it involves apparently a lot of chopping. The refrain will begin to sound, there's nothing to eat at our church. We're hungry. We want a sermon. No, not the Good Samaritan again, we're tired of that one. Give us, make us something we like. And if the preacher capitulates, then you are off and running with another generation of entitlement-driven folk who are always hungry, always hanging around the fridge, and who think the preacher's primary purpose in life is to wait on them. <clears throat> Worst of all, they never leave. They don't know how to fend for themselves, to let scripture be their daily bread. And all they can do is invite their friends back to your place and let you feed them. Apparently that's evangelism. You can see what a vicious cycle it can grow to be. Hungry people, exhausted preacher, 
and all that spaghetti sauce to cook. But the means to addressing it is totally within our capability. As the United Nations keeps reminding us, as this farm is living proof of, hunger is the number one killer on our planet, and not because there is not enough food for everyone. There is. We simply lack the will to change. We have to learn how to grow the food we need and distribute the food we have. And we must do this with scripture too. The survival of the planet depends on it because hunger of the body and hunger of the spirit will intertwine to devour our species. Here's what I propose. Invite the dropouts back to the kitchen. Release the wait staff. Tie on aprons and then open that gorgeously stocked scriptural fridge and together learn how to prepare what's in it. Learn to be community readers as well as solitary readers so we can feed ourselves and others. Also, take a cue from theater studies. Some texts need to be practiced as well as studied and we need to be set loose with them. So set aside time when we can st stop talking about scripture and learn how to live as those who have been set loose with it. I know this may sound out of sequence. Usually, usually we talk about setting the biblical text loose rather than ourselves with it, and certainly that is true. Scripture is wild and free, indomitable, inscrutable, intractable, irrepressible. Walter Brueggemann was my colleague. All those other adjectives he uses to string, he strings together to remind us of what we are dealing with in scripture. As one of my students remarked in a rather dazed way after he read scripture from the pulpit for the very first time, whoa, something happens when you're up there. <laughs> he was right. The biblical text is a wild thing and it takes us to where the wild things are. Let's see if we can get there. Yep. Yeah. We speak the words and they are, as Barbara Brown Taylor says, loose in the room. We have no idea what will happen or where it will take us, except that whatever it is won't look like anything we know. It is the wild and free vision of God's reign breaking its way in. Maurice Sendak may not have realized he was writing the perfect description of our biblical interpretive enterprise and task when he wrote Where the Wild Things Are. But he was, and let the wild rumpus start might even be the ideal call to worship. Take a look at what a wild rumpus could, doesn't that look like a professional? Yeah, there we go. Wild rumpus. I realize there are some very compelling post-colonial readings of Sendak's book, and those are important to read, but these days, in this last month or two, what I've really been thinking about is Maurice Sendak as the son of immigrants who are political refugees from Germany during the Holocaust. A companion move, however, needs to happen for us to let a wild rumpus start, and that is that we have to let loose. Put on our wolf suits like young Max, look how happy he is and sail away to where the wild things are, which is really another way of saying we need a reading space, maybe even an island, where we can make mischief of one sort or another with the biblical text. Now this could mean a departure from Bible study as we often know it. I once met a man in South Carolina who assured me, oh, I could never go to Bible study at my church. I don't know any of the answers. That man was an intelligent, confident, thoughtful person, and he was afraid to go to Bible study at his progressive church, I might add, because it exposed his lack of knowledge. Let me also say his congregation had one of the best church educators in the business, and it wasn't that she wasn't doing her job. For this man, however, this Bible, Bible study at his church looked like a school that is teaching to a test 
facts, figures, themes, doctrines, no church person left behind. He believed, he believed himself to be biblically illiterate. And for him, this was something shameful. His church offered no other way to gather around scripture, so he has slipped through the cracks and as a nifty side effect is totally dependent on his preacher to explain the text to him every week, which I am sorry to say this preacher really likes doing and is not about to give up. Once the cycle of power and dependency starts, it is really hard to break. I wonder if it's time for another move entirely. Our scripture encounters us in so many rich ways. It is a source book of wisdom. It is a storehouse of knowledge. It is also art, poetry, proverb, novella, epistle, epic, memoir, farce, myth. Our scripture is art in all its witnessing forms. And when you interact with art, you take a different approach. There is a time to talk about it, and then there is a time to be set free with it, to explore where it takes you and what it might show you. Here's what I've learned from my work with groups of scripture readers, students, pastors, lay people. When we interact with scripture as art, it frees something in us. Some need to explain it or solve it, or even as the poet Billy Collins puts it, torture a confession out of it, which is the preacher's Saturday night special. If you don't know this poem, I've just got to show it to you because it's an amazing poem by Billy Collins, former poet laureate. This is what he writes about his poetry students. I ask them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a color slide or press an ear against its hive. I say, drop a mouse into a poem, watch him probe his way out, or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of the poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. <laughs> they begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. When we interact with scripture as art, we do much better at putting on our wolf suits and making mischief with the text, at least for a few moments. Because we are less self-conscious, less burdened in that moment about the outcome, we can switch gears for a while, set aside all the other ways that we read the biblical text, all the important, critical other ways, and be open to something new. Here is something else I've learned. When the people of God read scripture together, in a let loose, wild rumpus, in your wolf suit sort of way, with no other purpose than simply to speak and listen to the words that are written. The same thing happens every time. We discover the script in the scripture. We see that our biblical text is a collection of scripts that God has given us to rehearse until something true emerges. And we become the repertory church. A repertory company is a small band of actors who perform together regularly. They get to know one another, they build trust, they grow over time, they move into different roles. Because they live in the same area, they put down roots. They grow older together. They're in and out of one another's lives. No one can afford to behave like an out-of-town star because this is ensemble work. Stars are constantly changing the subject to themselves. Ensemble players don't need to do that. They move in and out of the light and the shadows in big roles and in small ones because what they are most concerned about finding is something true to say together with this script. And they know it requires each one of them to do the hard work of being utterly honest. 
when my husband and I lived in Minneapolis after we graduated from seminary. We went regularly to the Guthrie Theater. Anyone know it? Yep. Um, it's worth a journey or even a move to Minneapolis. Um, we went regularly to the Guthrie Theater, which is a professional repertory company. It's gloriously talented. Every play was worth seeing, and some of them imported really big names for the lead roles. But the unexpected pleasure of living in Minneapolis for those years was observing how the same group of actors in the residential company grew over time. They appeared in each play in different roles. We had the fun of watching them pop up every few months as entirely new characters. So well camouflaged, you really had to pay attention to spot them. No one was ever typecast. An actor who played the king in one production might be the butler in the next, and each role provided a different challenge. The minor, minor roles were often more absorbing to watch and, I suspect, to play. Through it all, we saw the amazing trust the actors had for one another. It allowed them to take on terribly difficult roles, often in tough performing circumstances, like presenting three of Shakespeare's history plays in a single day, one memorable Saturday. A repertory theater for me is a powerful witness of what it means to work together on a common vision over the long haul. I have to say, I learned this the hard way. When my college classmates and I got our first scene assignment, it was from Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. We thought, we know what it means to work together. Actually, what each of us was secretly thinking was, I know how to do this. Get the plot down, figure out my character's motives, speak the words clearly, pronounce them correctly, and most important, show the professor I have talent with a dazzling new take on a classic role. And off we went in groups of four to do exactly that. And it didn't work. We were rehearsing together, but we were also trying to outdo one another. We had no idea what an ensemble was, no clue that it could be more than mowing one another down with our interpretive brilliance, and no awareness that our star-struck instincts would doom this sort of work from the start. Our academic training had formed us to be solitary readers in competition rather than a community of readers united in purpose. Only when our professor received what we'd brought to class and then patiently reworked it with us, very, very patiently, I might add, did we realize that what we were dealing with was something so much bigger than one person's talent or another person's cleverness. The truth wasn't about us. It came through us. It came through the words of the script that we spoke but only if our goal was to live in it rather than occupy and conquer it. Only if we had a common vision over the long haul. In time, our class stopped looking like a room full of scrabbling, aspiring stars and began working together as a group. We became what our professor was gently guiding us toward, a little repertory company. And then something else happened. We stopped arguing about whose interpretation was the best in all the land. We got over the competitiveness that ran between us bone deep. In its place, we noticed some strange new growth, appreciation, respect, trust, restraint, a generosity of spirit which flowed into hospitality and even grace. We saw that the script is so deep that there is always another way to play it and another way to read it. And that different casts of players can show you different sides of a scene and you don't have to decide which one was right or better or even definitive, just which moments were true. 
and that truth is a current we really do recognize when we're in it. And that it doesn't matter what the source of that current is, whether it came from your performance or someone else's, the joy and the momentum you feel when you see it is the same. And that any scene can stay fresh over and over as long as you are aiming for truth rather than innovation. And that some scenes may not be ours to play right now, but will be later when life has its way with us. And that there is beauty in the waiting. And that although the script is a given and you can't change the words, you can always change the way you play it, which in turn can change everything. A repertory company engenders this kind of learning. It isn't a perfect body, nor can it ever be. As my little theater studies class so plainly illustrates, you only had to take one look at us to know it. We were human, we were 19, our primary mode of transport was any streetcar named Desire, and it was the 80s, big hair, big egos, big, big egos. Yet, even our imperfect band of players experienced moments of truth. More moments than we had any right or reason to expect. Scenes would unfold, and with them a glimpse of beloved community. The plays of August Wilson, and Anton Chekhov, and Arthur Miller, and Carol Churchill contained beautiful and terrible visions of our humanity. We saw the worlds we settle for, and the worlds that might be, and how we could choose, we could choose, a life that mattered. We saw truth shining through those scripts and through our efforts to live in them. And if it is possible in a ragtag body of 19-year-olds like that, then I wonder what might be possible in a repertory church. The word needs a body. It wants to speak through more than one preacher and interpreter. It wants to speak through every member of the body because that's the purpose of all our reading and interpreting, to speak of God, to bear witness, to tell what we've seen and what we believe about what God is doing right now to liberate creation and set captives free, to be fully awake and alive in the script. That's what a priesthood of all readers and believers looks like when we read together, and we can. When the body of Christ is a repertory church versed in the script that is scripture, we become community readers for the sake of the world, God's world. Now, the best metaphor I know for a wide open, let's change gears sort of reading is just this, rehearsal. When we read scripture as a community, we're doing the same thing that musicians do at band practice, or singers do at choir practice, or actors do in rehearsal. Going through the script and practicing ways to play it. Reading the score, learning the notes, running the lines and building a character, setting a rhythm and layering beats. Rehearsal is a place to experiment, to try out as many possible interpretation, interpretations of a text as, as we can think of, and then we can decide how we want to perform it. The biblical text offers us more scripts than we could ever rehearse in one lifetime. Every text comes with an invitation to read it and then play it. And the great thing about rehearsal is you don't need anything to do it. It's free, it's simple, it's easily adaptable to any context you can think of, and there are really only four moves. First one is to get together, gather. You need a time and a place to read and interpret the script. Not alone. Not one person absorbed in his solitary reading. There's a time and place for that, and then there's not. Not one preacher in a coffee shop alone with her laptop. A community of readers, actual bodies, as, as many as will consent to gather, and you really can gather them. We can talk about that later. In a room, we'll talk, we're gonna talk about more of this tomorrow. 
The first move is just to gather. The second is to give the body the scripture to read and let them loose with it. Set sail for the island where the wild things are. There you go. That's the metaphor for rehearsal. Look at that. Bible study. Off we go. Um, you may have to distribute wolf suits if you're going to make mischief with the text, if the level of interpretive dependency in the group is especially high, if, for example, the people do not know that they have the right or responsibility to encounter scripture as art from time to time. It helps if the body knows the purpose of the gathering is not to make a sermon. Good reasons exist for why we don't throw let's make a sermon parties. The purpose of otherwise 